Our next speaker is uh, someone well known to me and you've already heard uh, from him and heard about him from some of our other speakers. Uh, David Fryer is, the, uh, is uh, one of the leading researchers and program designers in this country for survivorship and transition programs and uh, sort of following in the footsteps of Archie Blyer is developing new careers as he goes along and his latest iteration uh, fortunately for all of us is to focus on the adolescent young adult population. Um, David, uh, I think David's major uh, contribution is uh, his service as the chair of the Children's Oncology Group uh, uh, AYA Committee, um, which uh, has been a pioneer in the focus on clinical trials research in the AYA population. Again, this is a new field, and it, it really took a while to, to both convince uh, our colleagues as well as the NCI, although you, you now hear that we've done that. The NCI and the Institute of Medicine uh, of the importance of this field and David has been a leader in helping us move that forward with the Children's Oncology Group uh, which had which uh, uh, had a separate AYA committee uh, fittingly appointed initially by uh, Archie Blyer when he was the chair of the Children's Oncology Group and now continued under uh, Peter Adamson the current chair so um, what David has done is really set a model for the other cooperative groups. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the major clinical trials organizations for cancer in this country are the cooperative groups made up of just about all the, in one way or the other, all the institutions uh, doing major uh, cancer research in this country, uh, both in pediatrics and the adult area. And there, as you heard, I think there are four now total or four adult and one pediatric, four total. Four total, huh? Four plus one, so five total. Uh, I heard, I knew I heard someone's voice I heard there. Uh. <laughs> Who would know? Uh, and um, and through David's efforts, uh, uh, a lot of David's efforts and others, as you heard, we've just had the first meeting of the cooperative group leadership in AYA Oncology get together, and uh, the leader of the SWA group is Brandon uh, Hayes Latin here today. Got together in Cleveland to discuss a national strategy for the approach to clinical trials in the AYA population, and area which was not paid attention to until about five years ago, literally not paid attention to until five. So this is a major, major uh, important development that will really propel progress. That's the most important thing. Clinical trials are the way to propel progress in outcomes of AYA patients. So I want to introduce David to uh, talk about this effort uh, and to thank him for all of his amazing work in this area. Is this working okay? I don't know if I need the clip on or, okay, great. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. So I want to begin with a, uh, an acknowledgement slide, partly because I um, don't want to forget to include this because it's so important to thank um, our colleagues, but also to make the point early, and uh, I'll make it often, about how important collaboration is to move this field forward. I think there are arguably maybe no other field so critically dependent on collaboration um, across, you know, within our discipline, across disciplines, and so forth, and I hope that that will come out in the course of uh, my presentation. So uh, the other point to make here is that actually if you look carefully at the name uh, several of them actually are in this audience, and uh, unfortunately I'm unable to include everybody who deserves to be on this slide, but uh, thanks uh, to all for all you've uh, done, and hopefully your efforts will be reflected in these slides. So you've seen this slide already, or a version of it that Dr. Blyer presented before. I think uh, if there were to be one slide that uh, sort of said it all, uh, this is the one, and uh, one that you should leave remembering, because this is the initial finding that... Uh, 
uh, pointed out the problems and uh, suggested that something needed to be done. And the question is uh, that's, that's intrigued all of us who work in AYA oncology is what the potential explanations are for these poorer outcomes uh, in adolescents and young adults. Uh, one possibility is that uh, although the cancer may be called the same thing, they actually have a different biology. Uh, there are uh, questions about the host, that is the patient. Um, are there some developmental differences? that are age dependent that might affect drug disposition or tolerance of therapy or the level of adherence. Um, there's questions about the treatments themselves. Are they actually the optimal ones that should be used? And then finally, uh, health services questions. Uh, and you've heard some about the low awareness in the community, uh, delays in diagnosis, and so forth. And in this category, the low accrual to clinical trials is something that I think is, is very important and I think arguably could be uh, identified as potentially the central uh, issue uh, and and certainly should be a key focus for our strategies to try to improve outcomes in this patient population. Why is that? Well, you've already seen some data that suggests that uh, fewer than 5% probably, I was being a little generous here, uh, of adolescents and young adults actually participate in NCI-funded clinical oncology trials as opposed to 50% in younger patients. We know as well uh, in data that there isn't time to show you, but generated, as you might expect, by Dr. Blyer, that non-participation in clinical trials is actually correlated with smaller improvements. And some of the slides that he showed earlier, you know, alluded to that relationship. And this is a problem because not only uh, will the therapy probably be better for those patients, but actually non-participation in clinical trials inhibits a whole host of other important contributing factors uh, to the poor outcomes, which have to do with cancer biology, uh, host biology, as I mentioned, developmental pharmacology, the definitions and delivery of optimal treatment, and even adherence to treatment, which can be studied. So what I'd like to do uh, over the course of the next half hour or so, and I forgive me for moving quickly because uh, I am trying to pack in a lot of information here, is I'd like to discuss, uh, focus on this issue of clinical trials, if you will, or, or, or data that comes from cooperative groups uh, that do the clinical trials and uh, present to you some of the data that have uh, come from the AYA uh, uh, committee uh, in COG uh, regarding these outcomes, both in terms of survival and toxicity. And then I'd like to move to some very exciting work that's being done now uh, across disciplines, again, across institutions of emerging approaches to improve these uh, outcomes. And then finally, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, make just a very few comments about survivorship care in this population, which is important for completing the task of uh, taking care of them. So beginning first with a very brief introduction to AYA oncology research at the cooperative group level, this is uh, a, uh, present, or a slide that uh, was provided through the courtesy of Meg Mooney at CTEP, uh, which just gives you a visual impression of uh, the extent of the uh, clinical trials program that's uh, operated uh, and funded by the Children's, on or excuse me, by the uh, National Cancer Institute involving uh, over 2,000 institutions, some 14 to 15,000 investigators over 20,000 enrollments on NCI-funded clinical trials involving uh, many uh, different types of studies. And that's the context for the Children's Oncology Group, which is one of uh, the uh, funded clinical trials organizations. Um, for the COG, there are over 200 research sites in the United States. Uh, there are clinical trial opportunities for all, over 90 percent of our patients who are diagnosed with cancer, involving thousands of uh, investigators from various disciplines. And the studies span the breadth of uh, oncology, including, of course, prominently cancer therapeutics, uh, but also biology, uh, epidemiology, cancer control and supportive care, survivorship and outcome studies, and health services. And if you stop and think about it, AYA oncology crosses all of those. And that's why collaboration is so important, because we, we really need the expertise in all those different areas. So the AYA Oncology Discipline Committee uh, was launched in 2002 by someone uh, well known uh, to all of you, Dr. Blyer, and um, I think his uh, contributions in this regard. As last count, I think you've had three complete careers already, but um, in any one of them, most of us would be happy with uh, resting on those laurels, but uh, knowing Archie, uh, he's <laughs> probably got another one up his sleeve before it's all through. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so I think that uh, as I look back on it uh, through the prism of history, I think there are three uh, er uh, eras, if you will, that the AYA committee has gone through. The first, uh, launched by Dr. Blyer and guided by him, was really defining the AYA problem itself and uh, uh, describing that in detail in a couple of key publications. Uh, the Once the issue was on the radar screen, if you will, there was an era focusing on improving accrual simply by increasing awareness, launching a very important study that I'm going to mention in a few minutes called C10403, which for for treatment of ALL and AYAs, and then in the more recent era, our committee has been focusing on more fully characterizing AYA cancers and their outcomes, and then initiating some intergroup collaborations uh, in this field. And I think, as Dr. Siegel uh, very well said in, in one of his first comments at the beginning of the conference, um, it was clear to everybody that we need data. So our AYA committee and COG has really been focused on uh, trying to move from, you know, from the phase of being aware of the problem to drill down on it and trying to understand it. I don't want to get lost in this, but uh, simply to say that, uh, again, to emphasize the committee or the collaboration that's essential for this field, there's lots of people in here, but here's where the work is all done. It's the liaisons between our AYA committee and the scientific committees within the Children's Oncology Group. All of these diseases here, which are important in AYA oncology, and also other uh, scientific committees, uh, such as those mentioned here. So I'm going to move now into uh, describing some of the disparities and differences in AYA outcomes, and I'm, I'm limiting my comments really to those that have emanated from the Children's Oncology Group uh, because of, uh, uh, I think, their importance, but also uh, it, it leads into our discussion of new approaches to, to try to uh, further improve those. Um, this is a very important um, observation that I won't spend a lot of time on, but it was a seminal one uh, made by uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Nachman uh, and uh, Dr. Wendy Stock. Uh, when they analyzed outcomes in patients 15 to 21 uh, who were diagnosed with uh, ALL and were treated on pediatric versus adult trials, not in a randomized uh, setting, but uh, simply contemporaneous studies. And as you can see, there were striking, uh, in, uh, better, strikingly better outcomes among uh, that age group treated on pediatric trials compared with those in an adult. This raised a huge red flag and uh, was uh, then replicated in multiple sites and uh, now uh, numerous uh, settings uh, internationally as well as uh, in North America uh, that have shown that uh, patients with ALL in that age group fare better on pediatric therapy. The question is why. But this provided us a launching pad, if you will, to try to start asking some of the same questions in other disease areas. So in the COG, we looked at uh, outcomes in acute myeloid leukemia, a very important disease for, a, uh, for AYA patients, and looked at survival among 16 to 20-year-olds. This study was led by Jan... Um, Anna Franklin at uh, MD Anderson and uh, also uh, Bill Woods at uh, Emory University. And outcomes uh, were looked at from uh, a series of COG trials and compared with uh, CALGB and SWOG trials. So again, same age group contemporaneously treated. One of the important observations was that there was a stati statistically uh, higher complete remission rate after induction on the COG uh, trials. And when we looked at 10-year uh, overall survival, uh, there was a statistic uh, better outcome for the patients who were treated on the pediatric trials, very similar to the outcome seen with ALL. But interestingly, uh, although that was uh, 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 fairly striking, uh, the relapse risk for COG uh, treated patients as opposed to the adult trials was even strikingly more important. And it raised the question, well, why, what's happening uh, to bring about the deaths of these other uh, AYA patients who don't relapse? And it was found, in fact, that the uh, treatment-related mortality among the patients treated on the pediatric studies was higher, in fact, about twice as high as it was in the adult trials. So the question here uh, is that it's, a, it's an interesting finding, it's tantalizing, but we do, do need to have more uh, research to understand what those causes of death are. Yet, uh, it also points to the possibility that if we could bring that treatment-related mortality down, the survival might be even more strikingly better uh, on the pediatric types of uh, approaches. In a, a companion study, these are both actually uh, uh, in electronic form in cancer now, uh, in the same uh, issue of cancer. Um, another study was done 
uh, looking at AML patients in the same age group, 16 to 20 years, treated on a series of COG trials, so this is within COG, uh, and comparing the outcomes of patients in this age group compared with younger, so to see if there's perhaps on the same therapy, are there any uh, risks uh, associated with being older? And in fact, uh, looking at the presenting features, they were not strikingly uh, different, but there were statistically greater numbers of patients with what we would classify as high-risk AML based on cytogenetics and and uh, FLT3 status and such uh, determinants as that. And what was found is that the five-year overall survival, in fact, was a little bit uh, better, uh, or excuse me, slightly lower, but uh, marginally, of marginal statistical significance uh, in this age group. But again, the relapse risk was much lower for the AYA patients compared with the older patients. So why is that? Why are they, uh, why is the survival so close and yet they're not relapsing from their disease? And in fact, this was a Another very uh, important observation, I think, from this study, which is that the treatment-related mortality among the older patients, the AYA patients, was fully twice what it is in the younger patients. And when this was analyzed in a couple of different ways by excluding certain high-risk uh, groups, uh, such as BMT and so forth, it, it was a consistent finding. Um, it's difficult when secondary analyses are done to go back and look at data that have already been collected. You're limited by what's there, but it, suffice it to say that that among the non-BMT patients, infection was the overwhelming cause of death in these patients, and among those who did receive BMTs, graft-versus-host disease and veno-occlusive disease. So this has triggered, actually, some efforts to collect prospectively better data on the uh, current AML trial, focusing on this AYA question, and that's exactly the kind of flow we were looking for by doing these secondary analyses that uh, will uh, give us some preliminary observations that we can then move forward and answer in a more uh, uh, definitive, prospective way. We've also looked at survival disparities in some other diseases that are important for AYA, including osteosarcoma. In this uh, study uh, led by uh, Katie Janeway at the, the Dana-Farber, uh, the uh, several uh, st uh, studies of osteosarcoma run by our cooperative group were analyzed secondarily to look at the outcomes of older patients, those specifically uh, 18 years or older. There were no real differences in presenting features compared with the younger patients, but there was a difference in outcomes. And again, for 10-year overall survival, as you can see, there was a statistically worse outcome for the older patients compared with uh, younger patients, and this was true even when stratifying for site of disease and extent of disease. But when the question was asked about localized disease, maybe they would do a little bit better. Some thought was that maybe older patients are sort of over-enriched for uh, a higher risk disease. In fact, even for localized disease, uh, it was a, a striking uh, difference, so compared with uh, the youngest patients under 10 years of age, those who were 18 and older had a much uh, 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 more a greater likelihood of having recurrence. Uh, their risks for relapse was 1.55 times greater than it was for the younger patients. Another important bone tumor is Ewing sarcoma. Uh, in this study led by Karen Albritton on behalf of the uh, Bone Tumor Committee, uh, again, a series of uh, studies that had already been completed uh, in the Children's Oncology Group and related organizations were analyzed, over 1,200 patients. Uh, the clinical features important here uh, to point out is that the AYA patients actually did not take longer to complete therapy. There's been some thought that perhaps uh, the AYA patients are not as adherent and they don't get their treatment on time and don't maintain treatment intensity, but in fact, when that was analyzed here, that was not the case. Nevertheless, uh, the outcomes were again poorer for the older patients, and when looking at the lowest uh, uh, line here, the uh, 18 years and older, uh, the uh, hazard ratio for uh, an event on this study was two and a half times greater than it was for the younger patients. I know you can't read this, so that's why I provided that, which is that in a multivariate analysis, um, patients patients over 18, uh, even when adjusting for site, regimen, and analytic intensity, patients 18 year olders had a threefold higher risk of relapse. So we don't know why this is, but uh, we're hoping that this kind of information will propel uh, the very important biology studies that uh, need to be done uh, to understand this better. 
in the so area of soft tissue sarcoma, uh, Abba Gupta at uh, uh, Sick Children's in Toronto led uh, an important secondary analysis looking uh, at both survival and toxicity. And this actually kind of moved our committee in a new direction. In this study, uh, they looked at the uh, outcomes of patients treated on the fourth intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma study, over 600 patients who receive intensive chemotherapy. And what was somewhat of a surprise uh, to find was that uh, there were two uh, differences in toxicity. In one case for pancytopenia, when you look at this column here, which are the older patients compared to patients less than five years of age, they actually had less problems with low blood counts, low white blood cell counts, low anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Uh, why, again, is not completely certain. They weren't able to, to go back and look at uh, dose intensity quite the same way because this is a retrospective study. But at the same time, uh, this age group had a much higher risk, a fourfold risk, of developing peripheral neuropathy. And we've actually seen this now uh, borne out in another study that was published uh, by Brian Langholz, a biostatistician here at USC, who uh, worked with the Children's Oncology Group and did a similar type of analysis with some other disease groups. So this is a real finding and is also starting to uh, lead to some studies and energize some studies looking at uh, differences in developmental pharmacokinetics um, in this uh, age group. Also, although this wasn't the focus of this paper, uh, you can see here that the uh, event free five year event free survival was uh, significantly lower for the older patients than for the younger ones. There are several, uh, b uh, inspired by these results, we've, we've fanned out and begun to look at other disease areas as well, and we have similar secondary analyses that are in develop, or that are actually uh, poised to be uh, completed or, or far along in their development of these different uh, diseases, some brain tumors, uh, a, a different type of uh, myeloid leukemia, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, which would be uh, important uh, uh, thinking about uh, David's situation and then also uh, some exciting initiatives to reduce toxicity for uh, young men with testicular tumors. Uh, we also are very excited about a study that is far along in development, uh, which is a true intergroup study uh, looking at non-rhabdomyosarcomatous soft tissue sarcomas between COG and uh, the RTOG. So going back to this um, and remembering uh, that uh, poor outcome for the uh, AYA patients treated on adult uh, design trials, um, I really want to point out the importance of this, and I think everybody should keep their uh, antenna up for these results that are going to be reported at the uh, American Society of Hematology meeting uh, in just a month or so. Um, the intergroup phase two uh, clinical trial for AYA patients with ALL uh, called C10403, this was led by Wendy Stock at the University of Chicago, but championed uh, by Dr. Blyer, and I think um, single-handedly almost, uh, you know, brought brought forward, and then with a lot of help from people in various corners, it was uh, recently completed. So basically, this was a, an unrandomized uh, single-arm trial that took a regimen from the most recent, then most recent, COG uh, clinical trial for uh, ALL, high-risk ALL, and basically repackaged it and used it in an adult setting for patients 16 to 39 years of age treated at adult institutions. It was really to gain experience with this, to, to try to describe the toxicity the tolerance of therapy, and then actually also look at some other issues like adherence uh, of uh, the treating physicians to the pediatric regimen and so forth. Um, I'm not in a position to share the data because I, I don't have it, although people have smiles on their faces when they tell me that, so I, I think that um, we're all looking forward to seeing this. Um, but over 300 patients were treated. The study was uh, successfully closed in 2012, and as I mentioned, the data will be presented at the ASH meeting. Um, there are plans currently to use this platform for the next uh, trial for uh, ALL uh, patients in uh, this older AYA uh, group. Uh, so I, I do think that over the course of history, we're going to look back on this as a very important landmark. 20 minutes left or 20 minutes done? I'm gone 20 minutes, OK. All right. All right. OK. I've got my watch here, too. I'm actually. OK, so where are we going with all of this data? 
Well, I think it's important to point out that uh, for AYA oncology, the obvious is that the span is tremendous in age group, and it requires two different medical disciplines to be able to uh, manage this. Uh, certain pediatric cancers, we call them, occur in adults like ALL and the bone tumors that I mentioned, and some adult cancers that medical oncologists are more familiar with occur in uh, the younger patients, such as colorectal carcinoma and uh, melanoma. And so really to provide true comprehensive care that's a medically appropriate uh, to all of the spectrum, uh, we need we must have the scientific and clinical expertise of both uh, disciplines. There are, as mentioned, there are uh, several cooperative oncology groups, although fewer now because of uh, recent mergers. Uh, in North America, one dedicated to children and adolescents called the Children's Oncology Group, four for adults in the United States, and then one for adults in Canada. Um, Although both pediatric and adult groups have existed in the past, and there have been instances of collaboration, um, the, historically this has not been a strategic sort of approach, and it's been rather sporadic, just focused around a particular study here or there. So what we have, uh, where we find ourselves now, though, is that we have unprecedented opportunities, I think, to advance our field through structured collaborations among these NCI-funded cooperative groups, and this is driven partly intrinsically by the challenges that I mentioned, but also something that Dr. Seibel will be going into more detail about, the National Clinical Trials Network, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that, but suffice it to say here that the important thing is that under this NCTN, uh, we are really in a, in a situation where cooperation and coordination of efforts uh, between and among the cooperative groups uh, is, uh, is the new reality, and I think uh, this has been a, a struggle for the cooperative groups to respond to to some extent, but I think it couldn't work better, and you probably couldn't design a better structure to move along the field of AYA oncology. <clears throat> so this is a, a complex slide, but I really just want to emphasize the heart of uh, this, which is the National Clinical Trials Network. And as I mentioned, the Children's Oncology Group and SWOG, through the leadership of Chuck Blanke as uh, chair of uh, SWOG, and uh, now Brandon uh, Hayes-Latin, my friend and colleague who uh, chairs the uh, AYA committee in SWOG, are already, have already begun to uh, work together. But we've now been joined by uh, the three other American cooperative groups, the Alliance, ECOG, Akron, and uh, Energy, uh, also by the Canadian group, the NCIC Clinical Trials Group. And it's important to recognize, because I'm going to mention this in a minute, and I think it's key to the strategy of uh, improving outcomes among AYAs, is that this whole organization is in relationship with community-based sites in the United States, and uh, principally the uh, CCOP organizations. So please keep that uh, name in mind, because we think that we're, because adolescents are treated primarily in the communities, we really need to engage uh, the community-based sites that, uh, that open and conduct these NCI-funded uh, clinical trials. They exist to improve access, and you couldn't really have a better structure for doing that for adolescents and young adults. So the key recent developments are development of the SWOG AYA committee, as I mentioned uh, uh, just last spring. Oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, a very important conference that I believe uh, Nita is going to be speaking about, uh, a scientific update uh, uh, led by Nita and Ashley Wilder-Smith at NCI held in September, and then most recently an intergroup, uh, the first ever, actually, uh, AYA Oncology Retreat among inter, uh, the cooperative groups uh, hosted by COG and SWAG AYA committees uh, held just actually uh, 10 days ago. Now, going back to the uh, workshop that uh, Nita uh, organized at the NCI, I'm picking out just one uh, component of that, and I think she's going to discuss more broadly because it was very comprehensive and a superb conference. Uh, this is, these are the recommendations that came from one working group that was focused on clinical trials. There were several recommendations in these four categories to improve data collection and reporting, to improve community-based accrual, to expand intergroup collaboration, and to lower the barriers to clinical trials particip participation. And what I'm going to report to you here is really just the recommendations that focus on uh, that are, and that are relevant to the uh, cooperative groups. <clears throat> 
So one is to improve community-based accrual. And you me I mentioned before in that previous diagram the importance of the CCOP and other community-based organizations. So the recommendation from this clinical trials group at the NCI workshop was for our committees to work closely with the CCOP committees to try to raise their awareness of this issue and to identify some specific barriers and solutions that they might be able to pursue. And similarly, to identify specific institutions who might be uh, interested in developing initiatives uh, responsive to an RFA uh, for these institutions and supplemental awards to fund those efforts. Under the area of improving intergroup uh, collaboration, uh, we identified uh, the uh, ab opportunity to change the age eligibility, uh, eligibility for certain trials where they're biologically appropriate. In other words, bring the age uh, limits down for younger uh, for the adult trials and uh, raise them for the pediatric trials to be able to do more cross-group enrolling. Uh, additionally, uh, developing ultimately intergroup studies of common AYA cancers uh, uh, that uh, can really only be addressed uh, by collaborations between the two groups. We also uh, considered the possibility of engaging in a dialogue with the NCI about developing a, some sort of an intergroup uh, administrative AYA committee at the NCTN level, and then uh, finally to uh, invite all of the AYA representatives from the NCTN groups to attend uh, the retreat that was then uh, in the works. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you <clears throat> what was accomplished at this retreat. Uh, this is the first time we've really shared this information to 20 individuals representing several disciplines from five of the cooperative groups attended. It was hosted by Critical Mass and supported by these uh, organizations in terms of funding. Our, our objective really was strategic, which was to develop a relationship among these organizations that will carry us forward in terms of developing an intergroup uh, uh, relationship and uh, something that can lead to real uh, improvements. Uh, the agenda included uh, discussing enhancing accrual on NCI-funded trials, uh, trying to delineate what our role is in the cooperative groups for advancing research, and then we actually tried to drill down on the specifics of what elements of an intergroup uh, protocol would be useful to have fleshed out in order to support intergroup uh, efforts. So under the area of enhancing accrual on NCI-funded clinical trials, uh, suffice it to say that uh, our, our goal is to fully integrate uh, the clinical trials between the pediatric and adult groups, not just offer one to the other group, but develop them from the ground up using scientifically integrated uh, approaches. Um, however, the approval process is rather complicated, and so the action item that we have is that we're going to try to work with our friends at NCI to really explore and try to optimize the different levels of contact where we might be able to achieve better uh, integration of the AYA agenda. Under the area of uh, advancing research, uh, I mentioned this uh, intergroup collaborative study. Uh, Aaron Weiss, who is the chair of uh, the COG arm of this uh, study, presented it and some of his experiences that uh, uh, the successes and barriers and uh, facilitators and so forth. Our action item is to work with our group chairs to really find specific areas where the AYA committees can just foster and support this uh, intergroup uh, collaboration. And then finally, in the area of uh, advancing research of the, and the roles of the AYA committee, uh, here we're talking about developing protocols uh, that uh, have the elements identified that are really important for AYA patients, uh, eligibility criteria, informed consent issues, management of toxicity, because the, pra the practices and approaches differ between the adult and pediatric world, so it would be important to harmonize those. And we have some specific ideas to help develop consensus around those issues. Communication, respect, and compromise were mentioned by Brandon before. This came through clearly in uh, Aaron's presentation, and I think it's something that uh, not only could our Congress maybe uh, learn a lesson about, but uh, uh, certainly it's going to be key for going forward. So the future directions uh, for, the, uh, uh, for this intergroup activity are uh, uh, continued activity uh, involving the uh, core members of our group and an annual uh, intergroup retreat. I'm going to take just a couple minutes to kind of close this uh, because of the importance of uh, in continuing uh, to care for these patients after they complete therapy and uh, the survivorship issues. There's been some discussion about uh, who, uh, who are survivors uh, of AYA cancer 
cancer. And as you know, the definition for AYI oncology is 15 to 39 years. Um, I have held for a long time that I believe this should apply to survivorship as well because age continues to drive a lot of survivorship issues. The developmental biology and physiology of the host means that certain types of late effects occur in this group and not in other patients, and some late effects only emerge uh, in this age group. And of course, the psychosocial issues that have been discussed uh, continue in this age group even after survivorship. These are, the area, these are the issues that need to be followed among cancer survivors, detection and management of late effects, supporting their psychosocial functioning, uh, educating them as far as uh, having them be knowledgeable about their health risks and what they can do to prevent those, and uh, of course the financial challenges of uh, health insurance. We have several studies that have been uh, launched within COG to address these AYA-focused issues, two of them looking at fertility, one of them uh, monitoring cardiac function uh, following treatment with cardiotoxic therapy. Going back to the age issue, I think if you look at the 15 to 39 year group, there are three distinct areas. Uh, patients who were treated uh, for childhood cancer, they were treated less than 15 years of age. Survivors of adolescent cancer treated at 15 to 19 years of age, and then survivors of young adult cancer who were treated in uh, the older age group. And there are some implications, I think, for service models. This is the model that we use uh, here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, and the important thing here is this area in the circle, which is our transition program. When our, our patients, our survivors reach 21 years of age, we uh, stratify them into two groups, a low risk group where their risk for recurrent or for problems uh, related to treatment is very low, and higher risk group by virtue of their treatment where their issues are more common. And in that group, they're followed actually in an adult program that we do in collaboration with our colleagues at uh, Providence St. Joseph Medical Center in Burbank to follow these group. This group here is followed by their primary care uh, providers. I think I mentioned before uh, the potential models that we could be thinking about and uh, something that we've been brainstorming about uh, quite a bit uh, here at Children's and also uh, with our colleagues at USC is a unified adult cancer survivorship program where we have three streams of survivors from Children's Hospital, the AYA program here, and uh, the USC Norris Cancer Center, which uh, is treating some of the patients uh, already in the adult uh, world. and. Uh, uh, putting them under the umbrella of a single adult survivorship program that has all of these adult survivors from these different uh, sources. Uh, the common population is all adult survivors that are more alike by age at survivorship rather than age of treatment, and I think this offers a lot of opportunities for clinical efficiency, uh, more resource sharing, and, and importantly, research, and we would be modeling this on our successful pilot experience at uh, uh, Providence. So uh, in conclusion, I would just say that I think there's a growing body of data that I hope you've been uh, convinced by supporting these disparities. They're real for AYA patients and that we clearly need more research to elucidate what these are and, and what the mechanisms are. Uh, survivorship is an essential component and I think that it's certainly true that improved outcomes uh, can not only optimally but probably only be achieved through collaboration between our medical disciplines and, uh, and others. So thank you very much and I'll look forward to answering uh, your questions a little bit later. Thank you.